If you look there in verse 10, uh, we'll see a bunch of names starting around verse 2. I'm not going to insult your intelligence and insult my way of speaking by calling out all of those names. So I'm going to read these first two verses and then I'll read verse 28. Uh, 38 verse 1 in, chap in chapter 10 and verse 28 chapter 10 is what I'm going to read. We see these names are here. We'll speak about them uh, throughout this lesson briefly. But uh, we, before we do, I want to ask the question, what does devotion truly mean to us? What does devotion, what does it mean to you? I'm not talking about reading a devotion. I'm talking about devotion, being devoted. What does that mean? Spending time with God? Yeah. Uh, well, to be devoted to him, we have to be committed to him, don't we? To spend the time with God that we need to, to, to get quiet and alone with God as we should, it takes commitment. It takes real commitment because there's so many distractions. If you decide you're going to wake up early and spend time with God before anyone wakes up, that's going to take commitment. Unless you're naturally an early riser. Um, but if you're not, it takes a true commitment. Um, a devoted person commits their energies. The, a devoted person commits to all to the things that they're tasked to do. Practically every person in, in, in every organization covet people who are devoted. Uh, businesses want devoted people, don't they? They want their employees to be devoted. They want their consumers to be devoted to them. Um, they, husbands and wives, they want devoted spouses. Uh, sometimes it's a little unrealistic, <laughs> uh, the devotion that we desire, but it's, um, but truly we, we want devoted spouses. Um, I think television and storybooks have sometimes forgotten the reality of human nature and they paint a picture that's not that's not realistic, especially when it comes to marriage. And because marriage takes two devoted people who are willing to do the work to keep the marriage together. Because marriage is work. It's not, it's not a fairy tale. It's not something that, that you, you, you dream this thing and you have these big ideas that, that doesn't come with a cost. It comes with a, a, a heavy price. And so when we, have, when we have expectations that aren't realistic, our devotion will begin to wane. Um, social organizations, they want, devoted, they want devoted, dedicated, loyal people. Uh, the church desperately needs devoted people. Uh, people who are willing to do what needs to be done. Without it being a, a job to us, with it being something that we get to do, it becomes a part of who we are and something that we just do without it being so much of a sacrifice. Uh, teachers want devoted students. Students want devoted teachers. Um, coaches want devoted players and players want devoted coaches. Uh, because with that, without that devotion, it's going to be hard to succeed or be successful in whatever we're doing. So we find that, that with all of this devotion, there is a greater devotion that God is craving. Let's look here in these verses. Verse 28, it says, because of all of this, we make, sure, we make a sure covenant and write it. Our leaders, our Levites, use... Our leaders 
our Levites, and our priests seal it. Now those who placed their seal on the document were Nehemiah the governor and the son of Hakaliah and Zedekiah. And then we see all these other names down to verse 27. And then verse 28 says, Now the rest of the people and the priests and Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, and Nethanim, and all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, everyone who had knowledge and understanding. Everyone who had knowledge and understanding. So what we find is here some people are committed to some things. Uh, the Lord, it craves our devotion. He craves our loyalty and our commitment. Uh, he longs for people who will be totally committed to him. Uh, the Lord's craving the devotion of our hearts, our lives, our, um, our commitment, our loyalty. He, he, total devotion is the subject of the passage in which we're dealing with tonight and what we'll deal with throughout chapter 10. When we, uh, the, the returned exiles had gathered together for worship. So we've got, we have to remember this setting they're in. They're fasting, they're praying, they're seeking God for revival. And not long before this gathering, they had completed the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls. They had completed some of the, uh, most of the building of the homes within Jerusalem. And, and now they're settling in and they're focusing on not only rebuilding Jerusalem, but be rebuilding their society. They're wanting to rebuild their nation, their people. And so above all else, they knew that the foundation of rebuilding this society, oh, the foundation of rebuilding their lives and this nation, it had to be upon God himself and on God's holy word. That had to be the foundation. What is our foundation? We preached on it not too long ago when we were in 1 Corinthians. Well, it may have been a while ago. I, I know it was in chapter 3. We talked about the foundation of our faith is that Jesus is the Christ. And so here, the Jews, the, this is before Jesus has been here. It's before Jesus comes. So the Jews are rebuilding their nation but they're building it upon or rebuilding it upon God's word. So they needed to be totally devoted to the Lord. They needed to be totally loyal to the Lord. And, and so for this reason, they began to meet together to seek the Lord and to study his law. To study God's law was to study the commandments. They were determined to rebuild their lives, to rebuild their nation upon four basic commitments and the first commitment that we see is a covenant they're making a covenant to God's law uh, here you see the Bible teaches us that if we if you love me keep my commandments basically he's saying if you love me you'll keep them if you don't keep them you don't love me you know, this is a true test. It's a re revelation of our true love to God. Do we keep his commandments? Do we honor him and keep his word? Do we live by his word? Are they catchphrases for us when, we go, when we're around certain people? Or are they a way of life for us? If they're only a catchphrase, then we, we have to question our true devotion, our true loyalty to him. This covenant was drawn up by the returnees as a binding commitment. This commitment wasn't to one another. This was a commitment they were making to God. And so they were committing their lives to obeying God's law. They were wanting to obey his holy word. And to be successful in rebuilding their lives, it was necessary that the entire community honor this commitment. You know what a commitment does? Well, when we are committing something, especially if it's documented, you know what it does? It holds us accountable. What is it that we don't like? 
Yeah, we don't like to be held accountable. <laughs> we, we don't like someone looking over us. Now, one thing I don't like, and, and I, if I do this, I, I apologize. If you're in leadership and you, you think that I do this, please talk to me. I don't like micromanagers. I, I really don't. Tell me what you want done. And if I need to, some instruction, I'll ask. If I don't need instructions, let me get it done. Uh, and if I get it done a little different than what you would do, understand that there's no two people that's the same. There's no two people who move and, and operate and do things the same. And there's no two people that think the exact same. As a matter of fact, I've learned this, that no one's going to do things exactly how I would do it. Some's going to do it better. Some's going to do it faster. Some's going to do it different, but it, it still gets done. And I, I remember, I remember very distinctly, we were doing, we were at a storm and it was around Christmas time. I, as a matter of fact, I think we left Christmas Eve and we were on storm break. There was ice and snow everywhere and I was up a pole on belt and hooks. And daddy yelled at me and said, Yo, you need to do I said, man, if you'll go on, <laughs> I'm the one up here. Let me get this done. At the time, it was, I, we, I was cold. We'd been out most of the, uh, all day and most of the night, and I just weren't in the mood to hear somebody telling me what to do when I knew what I was doing. <laughs> and so I, I started learning then that everybody just does things a little different. I didn't speak to Daddy just that way. I'd have been afraid to come off. I'd probably still be up the pole. <laughs> exactly. It does. It destroys morale. And if we, if we have to micromanage, then we're not effective leaders. But so people are going to do things differently. And often because we are different, we... We don't like to be held accountable. We don't, you know, we, we just, we, we don't like that. And because we don't like it, we can get frustrated. And, you know, we don't like to sign covenants. We don't like to sign covenants because they're going to hold us uh, accountable. Well, here, if this, here the people of Israel, the, the Jews, they wanted, they wanted their society built upon obeying God's word and the only way that could take place was that everyone had to join in in this commitment two or three people couldn't be committed enough for the whole nation two or three people or even a couple hundred people wouldn't be enough for them to build their society around you know why because if while there are a couple hundred that's saying we're going this way with well, these Several hundreds of thousands are going to override these couple hundred. And they're going to override them through groups who are going to just have a revolt against them. We see that happening all the time now. And now, we, now people have a revolt over any little thing. It's because they don't want to be held accountable. And, and this is what this nation wanted. They wanted to be held accountable. They wanted to work, to live by God's law, which meant there had to be a covenant and this covenant would hold them all accountable. Everyone needed to do this. Everyone needed to be committed to, in order for this to work. Um, so every family in the community needed to adopt this document to make a personal commitment to follow God and to make the word of God the authority of their lives. If God's word was to become the law of the nation, everyone had to be committed to it. And here's why. If my child disobeys the law, I've got to be committed to what everyone else is or I'm going to think my child needs to be uh, given a break. However, when someone else's child breaks the law, I may not be as gracious with their child as I would be mine. So if we have the same covenant and everyone has signed it, then we're all accountable. And we can't look for favors outside of the rule in which we've all signed. And therefore, then 
my child's not getting an advantage over somebody else's child. So this is what they knew they wanted. This is, they knew that this was important to them. They wanted this covenant. Um, so what we find here is that the leaders of the returnees, they made the decision to write out the commitment that they were making to the Lord in a binding document. The legal document was sanctioned by the chief uh, civil leaders, Ze uh, Nehemiah and Zedekiah. These, the priestly leaders, which numbered 21 names, and we see some of those names that I didn't, uh, I didn't read out. The Levite leaders uh, numbered 17 names, and the political leaders numbered 44 names. Now, obviously, they felt so strongly about this written document that their commitment would be more meaningful and also more likely to be kept than a verbal agreement. Because in a verbal agreement, you can, <laughs> you can be deceptive and say, well, that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. Oh, that's what y'all meant when you said that. Oh, oh, I, oh I, didn't, I didn't realize that's what you were intending. So I, I'm no longer going to abide by a verbal contract. But if it's written down, listen, before you sign your name on something, you need to know what you're signing. Even something as simple as uh, use of the Family Life Center. We have a commitment or a covenant or an agreement that the church has with someone who rents the Family Life Center. And the church has the privilege of keeping the renter accountable to what's on the letter may not like it, but we have that privilege. We had a golf, one of our golf tournaments several years ago. We learned, I learned a valuable lesson. Read the fine print. <laughs> Read the fine print. Because in the contract, which I glanced over, even though it was highlighted, I glanced over it. And it stated that if we, any tournament held on Saturday, you pay for 100 players. That's what we had to pay the golf course, 400 players. Well, at this particular uh, venue, at this particular tournament of ours, it was the lowest attended a tournament as far as golfers than we had ever had. It's still the lowest that we've ever had. As a matter of fact, they were, there was a tournament the day of at another golf course that a lot of our players played in, and a tournament the day before. Now, after you spent $60 on a Friday, these golfers, it's hard for them to spend $60 again on Saturday. And, and in, the, in the organizing, now we had our schedule a year out. The others threw theirs in a couple months before. So we, we were affected greatly by it. We had 45 golfers. And we had to pay $20 a golfer. And because the tournament was on Saturday and it was on the contract, we had to pay for 100 golfers. We, we lost, in a sense, uh, that, that year. That was the least amount that we ever collected for because we had the, the tournament itself didn't pay the expenses that year. We had to go into uh, some of our sponsorship money. But we had to honor that contract because I had signed it. It was my fault that I didn't read it. So whenever there is an agreement that we sign our name to, we're saying we're fully in agreement with it, whether we understand it or not. So we should, we should be sure to read anything that we sign our name to. And here they knew, the people of Israel knew, that if they signed their name to this, then they were to be held, they could be held accountable to being committed to this covenant. Uh, the re now keep in mind, the Jewish returnees, they wanted their nation to be richly blessed by God. So they were adopting the laws of God as the laws of the nation. And the rest of the people did, did not sign, but verbally agreed 
to follow God, to make his holy word the basic law of the land. So even the children, even the children who are old enough to understand, they gave a verbal agreement to this document. And along with the, those who converted to Judaism, they were allowed to join in this commitment because they were forsaking their God for the God of the Jews. So they had this covenant agreement. Now, the purpose of the agreement was twofold. First, the returnees wanted a sworn oath that every citizen would obey God's law. They wanted a sworn oath that every citizen would obey his holy commandments. Second, the returnees wanted every citizen to understand that God's curse would fall upon them if they disobeyed God's law. Now, can we expect God to bless us when we're disobeying him? You know, there's a lot of times maybe prayers aren't answered in the way we want them to be answered because of unconfessed sin in our lives. Now, God's a gracious God. He's a merciful God. But it rains on the just and the unjust. So God's, when we are unfaithful to him, and we have unconfessed sin in our lives, it's almost problematic for us to expect God to honor us or to answer us in the way that we want him to. It doesn't mean he won't answer us. It just may not be what we, we would want. So here, to make absolutely sure that everyone understood the, agree the agreement, every citizen swore an oath that they would obey God's law and accept his curse or his judgment if they disobeyed or if they broke his law. You know, for me, I'm so glad we have the Holy Spirit that lives within us. Aren't you glad that you're well aware of when you have unconfessed sin in your life? And we have no excuse in not confessing and repenting of that sin. And it's because of the Holy Spirit that we, that we often do. Because with us, if we didn't have the Holy Spirit alive within us, we wouldn't confess that sin. As a matter of fact, it wasn't until the Holy Spirit sat down with us and started convicting us that we needed a Savior, that we actually confessed our sin and repented from our life that we were living and called out to Jesus and gave our life to him. So that same Holy Spirit that drew us is now living within us to convict us, to help us, to counsel us, to let us know when we are outside of the will of God. Uh, God is extremely gracious and merciful to us, more so than what we deserve. But I'm so glad he is, aren't you? So the foundation of human life and society is to be God's holy word, his commandments. That should be the foundation of any society. Should be the foundation of every life. God expects everyone and every society to obey him. Does this happen? No. No, we all got loved ones. We've all got family. We've all got friends, co-workers, people we spend time with from time to time that are unbelievers. It's not God's will for them to be unbelievers. But, but that's just the reality. That's, that's exactly right. God would have it that every nation would serve him. But obviously they don't. And if you poll the United States, we're not the Christian nation that people keep saying we are. As a matter of fact, I have, I've had trouble with that all my life because we're a nation whose leaders, whose leader, founding leaders, uh, prepared the document and they made it awfully easy for outside religions to come in here. You don't find that nowhere in scripture where God wants to make it easy for outside religions to be a part of his family. He, forbid, he forbade it. As a matter of fact, when they crossed the Jordan 
and went into the promised land, he told them to destroy everyone. But then we as a country open our borders up. We're not the Christian country we think we are. It's not that we're not supposed to be welcoming and hospitable and and willing to share the gospel. But we should be very careful in, in the gods that we've allowed to come into this place because it's the lack of caring about that is why our children and grandchildren face what they face. And why we as a people, as parents and grandparents, are starting to become very laxed in the reality of sin. Things that we didn't allow. Oh, yes. It truly is. It truly is. And, and it's, it's, it's the direction society has moved. Now, what do we do? We don't start revolts. We don't start protests. No, we, we be Christian. We be Christ-like. When we meet people, we be Christ-like. And if we're Christ-like, then we're trying to win them. There was never anybody that Jesus didn't try to win. There were those who he knew he couldn't win. He just left them alone, left them to themselves. And there are times when we're going to have to do that. There are times when we're going to struggle with our children and grandchildren because we can't win them. And it's for us to leave alone, seek God, and let someone else come by and win them. Because it can be very, someone else. It's some, and some of you may have friends who have spouses who are lost. And if they've got spouses who are lost, sometimes the spouse isn't the best person to win the other spouse to the Lord. Sometimes I preach it and we prepare the way. Yeah. Uh huh. And, and give them um, a more reality or help them figure out right. what has been prepared for and ahead of them. Well, it goes along with the parable some, some plants, some waters. <laughs> but God gives the increase. Yeah, so we, we have to, we're, we're coming to the, to the realization that. The foundation of this society is not based on Christ, but that doesn't give us a reason not to serve the Lord, not to be a light in this world, not to still live our lives by his holy word. So the, the longer we go, the further we go in life, with the more politicians that we put in office, no offense, Brother Gerald, we're not talking about the Lumbee tribe. We're talking about we're talking about Washington. The longer we go and people are being put in office, we're going to see less of the commitment to the laws that were used when we when this country was founded. Uh, they're going they're going farther and farther away from God's law, and they're implementing new laws and new laws that go against God's word. And so, in in all the amendments, someone said, someone said the genius of the Constitution is that it's incomplete. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah. And the the reason they say that is because they they said that the men who wrote the Constitution knew they were flawed and imperfect. And, and they were fallible men. So therefore, they didn't complete it. They left it so that other men could come behind and add where it needed to be added and maybe even take away where it needed to be taken away. The problem with that is that men who are not led by the Spirit of God are the ones who are adding. Men and women who are not led by the Spirit of God, they're the ones who are adding and taking away. And therefore, it's not benefiting us. What they see is right here. They can't see the broad picture that God sees and that God saw when God gave his law. Remember, when God gives us any instruction, 
He's got past, present, and eternity in front of him. So he gives us his word because he sees what is best for us. And when we don't like his word, we're basically saying we don't like <laughs> what's best for us. That's the, the problem we have is that we can see right in this moment. We can't see the next moment. We don't know no better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So why, why? well, we've, we've shared <laughs> the word of God. What it does is it instructs us how to, we are to live. Exactly. No, we don't know how to live ourselves. We don't know how to, how we are supposed to go about our daily lives. You know, if we're left to ourselves, who's going to take care of the orphans? Yes, we would. We'd be in a mess. God's word tells us how to build a successful society. His words, his word is not given to us to be burdensome to us. It's so that we prosper. It's so that we benefit, that we, that we become everything that he would have us become. So what does it set in our minds and hearts? What does a successful society look like? Obedience to God. I used to think, just like you said, you didn't read all the whole gospel. When these different religions would be coming in, I, I always thought, well, they don't believe nothing. It ain't nothing. Because everybody knows God. And God's the true God in every way. And, but now look here 50 years later. Yeah. What's happened. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of parents who said exactly what you said were, well, you know what? My child was raised in that Christian in, in a Christian home. There's no way they'd get involved with, in another religion. And their daughters are marrying guys in other faiths, in other religions. And you know what we as parents will say? Well, you know, we, 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 can't, we can't control. I can control who comes to my house. I can control that. Uh, and while my daughter was living in my house, I could control who she dated as far as who they brought to my house, who she brought to my house. Now, what she done when she was out of my sight, no, I couldn't control that. None of us can. None of us can. But, but yeah, that boundaries, guidelines, we, we can't be afraid to put them in place. Our parents put them in place for us. It didn't hurt us. It may, we may not have liked it. There's a lot of things daddy done and I didn't like, but it was for my good. And we've got to think that way with our children, our grandchildren. There, there've got to be boundaries. You know, we're not going to have a successful uh, society if you don't think the way Brother Brian and Miss Evelyn was just sharing. We, it's got to be filled with morality and righteousness and just. If, this, if society isn't filled with this, then it's not going to be successful. It's got to be productive, economic, and economically sound. God's word teaches us how to use our money. It teaches us that we're not to be a slave to a lender. You know what? What if China called up their debt? What if they called their debt up right now? Yeah. There's, there's a reason. There's a reason our, our industries left and went overseas. Part of it is because we were just in, so in debt. We had no other choice. When we think about this, uh, our country, you know, we, we hear, we can see it everywhere. And there's all sorts of trainings and things about how to manage money. And our country is doing a pitiful job illustrating that, aren't they? Uh, so caring and being compassionate uh, <laughs> we would be a country that's filled with compassion and caring. There's enough of empty buildings. 
and the government is given away enough to where the homeless situation could it could be took care of it could be it could be took care of priority and lack of compassion um we see peaceful and secure, a, having a place that, a society that's very peaceful and secure. You know, in Robinson County, if you go, if you go to China, I think that's, ain't that where Brother Crafton's grandson was at? China? Japan. Japan. He's, Brother Crafton went there last year, year before last, spent a couple weeks with him. Yeah. And, uh, he said one thing he never saw was litter. Now, here's the thing. You go and you ride around and you see a place clean where there's no litter anywhere. The first thing that comes to mind is you're safe here. You go into neighborhoods that are well manicured and, and kept up, the first thing you think about, this is a safe, this is a nice place to live. It's nice because you think it's safe. Quiet. Um, you don't even look at that, that. Looking at the size of the houses is secondary. But you come to Robinson County, you know what we'll do? Our guys will drive to Raleigh, they'll work all day. Drive home from Raleigh with everything that they ha they can put in their vans and trucks, and as soon as they cross the county line into Robinson, everything goes out the window. And it's been that way for decades. Yeah, I, I say vans and trucks, cars too. Yeah, throw it in the swamp. And then, and then, and then, get on put on social media and trash the, the community. The community is made up of people. Uh, it's a place of respect for human life and property. That this is what a successful society looks like, and God gives us those instructions to have that in His Word. Um. A society of peace and prosperity can be built only if people look to God and his holy word for direction. God's word teaches us to treat one another as we desire to be treated. Not as we are treated. Let me take this a little further. Can you give me a, a couple minutes just to stay right there on that statement? We are to treat others as we desire to be treated. What that means is no matter how we're being treated, we're going to treat others the way we want to be treated. So that same person who spits in our face, we're going to treat them the way they, the way we would want them to treat us, not the way they treat us. Is that not right? According to Scripture. The Bible teaches us we are to turn the other cheek. Now, let's, let's go a little further. Let's talk about marriage. So, when I got married, this is, this is what, you know, just you read through this, uh, through scripture, and, and it, it, it'll slap you in the face sometimes. When I got married, I made a commitment to my wife, to God, and the people who were there. And the commitment, it was my commitment to her. And God heard it. Then she made a commitment to me before God and others. Now, nowhere in my vows did I say, I will love, honor, and respect you as long as you love, honor, and respect me. <laughs> it would bring me a lot of justification, wouldn't it? <laughs> we 
you should have had that. But it, it, it wasn't in my vows. It, it wasn't. So basically what I told my wife before God and others was, no matter how you treat me, this is how I'm going to treat you. And she did the same. We forget that often, though. <laughs> this, is, this is how I'm, I'm going to love you, regardless of how you love me. Now, <laughs> just, just dwell on that for a little bit. You know why, we're called, why we have a helpmate? Why our spouse is called a helpmate? Is to, there to help us to do what we've committed to do. So when I don't treat my wife as I had said I would, she's to help me to realize I didn't and to help me to realize what I need to do in order to do that. Because me treating her this way, even though we may have said the exact same vows, what I have to do to treat her that way may be different than what she has to do to treat me that way. Men and women are different. We know that, right? That's why we belong together. We fit because we are not alike. We, we got that right. So if for me to love, honor, and cherish my wife is going to be going to look different than her loving honoring and cherishing me but regardless of how I treat her that's her duty and regardless of how she treats me it's my duty and if I don't know how to treat her that way she's supposed to help me and if she don't know how to treat me I'm supposed to help her we can't we can't hold things against one another and use it as a weapon that don't belong to us because once we get married, we belong to one another. We're, what's hers is mine. What's mine's hers. And so we can't use that against each other. When we do, we are defying God's law. And when we defy God's law, then we're saying we don't want anything to do with God's law. And, and so this is, it's, I mean, it, 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 when the word teaches us, we are to treat others as we want to be treated. It's not an easy thing to do. It's, it's not. And sometimes it might mean we got to walk out of the room because I would want them to do that if I, if I was making them as mad as they're making me. Yeah, because I would want them to if it was me. Yeah. So, and you know what? Here's the truth. Here's the truth. If I can't, if I just can't love this woman, then maybe the best way to treat her is how I would want her to treat me. And that is sometimes it's to walk away. If it means I've got to abuse her to live with her. Or she's got to abuse me to live with her. What I would want her to do for me <laughs> is to leave me alone. Is that not right? We... God's word teaches us if we treat each other the way we desire to be treated, we'll all be better for it. It teaches us uh, that we should love our neighbor as we love ourselves. We, and if we love our neighbors, we will respect human life, property, and rights of others. We won't worry about stealing. We won't worry about locking doors. If we all done this, if we were a society with, with, that done this, within so, a, a society based upon God's law, there'd be no theft, no murder. Uh, there'd be no assaults, no abuse, no prejudice, no discrimination, no violation of anyone's rights. Now imagine a society without lawlessness, violence, 
A society where people genuinely cared for one another and looked after the welfare of each other. Instead of being selfish and greedy and covetousness, we'd be giving and reaching out to help others, no matter what their need was. That was seen in the early church. In the first century church, it was seen for they had all things in common. They brought all their goods together and they distributed it out equally among everyone so that no one would be without. Well, that, weren't even, that didn't even work right. So we know that's not the way to do it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Somebody, somebody just wasn't honest about their goods. And, and so that, that wasn't what God intended. That's what they did. What God intended was for there to be, a, when there was a need, then he, those who didn't have the need but were blessed, he expected them to help the ones that were in need. That's been God's purpose. We wonder why, why is there a homeless problem? Why is there an emotional, um, emotional issues that people are having to deal with? Why is there physical disabilities that people have to deal with? Why, why are all these things there? It's not to punish us. It's so that we can be a blessing to one another. I don't know if you've been, well, if you've been around children, you know who amazed me the most? The children with Down syndrome. They amaze me the most because they, they're just so lovable. And they love you regardless. Regardless of how you treat them, they love you. And they, you can watch them. When I was in, in school, getting ready to graduate, I had to do my internship. Uh, and I was a park and rec uh, major. So my internship was with Special Olympics. And I'd watch these kids when we were organizing uh, some of the events for them. Man, winning? They didn't care about winning. They just wanted to have a good time. And you've seen the commercials. I saw it in real life. One fall when they just stopped. They stopped the race to help each other up. And it, it, it's amazing. And we look at that and we'll say, or oh, that poor child. No, poor us, that we're not like them. We don't have the heart that they have when I say we're not like them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why Miss Miss Ernie got it up. Second Timothy three and sixteen tells us Scripture is the best way to live our lives by Scripture, to build a society around it, because Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and it's profitable to society for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. 1 Peter 1 and 22 tells us, since we've been purified, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. And this is taught to us in scripture. James 1 and 25 says, but he who looks into the law, perfect law of liberty and continues in it, it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in what he does all because he's centering his life and he's a doer of the word of God now that is the first of four things that that this covenant was uh, was about that it really stressed we'll look at the second one next week